Hello and welcome to It's a Code You, Mental Health Support for Those Working in Healthcare. This is a podcast created for healthcare employees to explore not only issues relating to mental and emotional health, but also unique challenges that those working in healthcare are faced with. Your hosts are Adina Tucker, a licensed clinical social worker with Dartmouth Health, and Jennifer Henze, an MSW also with Dartmouth Health. Today, we're going to be talking about relationships, specifically romantic relationships. And Dr. John Gottman, who most people have heard of, is a world-renowned psychologist, and he's known for his work on marital, marital stability and divorce prediction. And he conducted a study with newlyweds and then followed up with them six years later. And many of the couples actually remained together, but many also divorced. The couples that stayed married were much better at one thing, and that's the turn towards instead of away. And at the six-year follow-up, couples that stayed married turned towards one another 86% of the time. Couples that divorced averaged only 33% of the time. This is a pretty incredible piece of data. It suggests that there's something you can do today that will dramatically change the course of your relationship. And more importantly, it suggests that there is something you cannot do that will definitely lead to its demise. So how do you turn towards instead of away? Well, in order to understand this turning aspect, you first have to understand bids. So let's get into it. What are bids for connection? A bid is any attempt from one partner to another for attention, affirmation, affection, or any other sort of positive connection. The bids, they can show up in simple ways, maybe a smile or a little wink, or even more complex ways like a request for advice or asking for help. In general, women make more bids than men, but in the healthiest relationships, both partners are comfortable making all kinds of bids to one another. Yeah, and to miss a bid would be to turn away. And turning away is something that can be devastating. It's even more devastating than turning against or rejecting the bid. So rejecting a bid at least provides the opportunity for continued engagement and repair. Missing the bid results in diminished bids or worse, making bids for attention, enjoyment, and affection somewhere else. So in heterosexual couples, men are reportedly more likely to miss a bid for affection, to not notice it, or to respond to one entirely from their, or to not respond to one entirely from their partners. And while extensive extensive relationship research is still limited for LGBTQ couples, Dr. Gottman and his wife, Dr. Julie Schwartz Gottman, have researched and observed the strength and resilience of same-sex couples. There's been one key finding. Overall, relationship satisfaction and quality are about the same across couple types, straight, gay, lesbian, that Dr. Gottman has studied. Their study found that same-sex unions were comparable to heterosexual ones in satisfaction and quality, but that there were slight differences in how gay couples interacted and handled conflict. So what they saw was that in gay and lesbian relationships, they tended to be a bit healthier than those of heterosexual couples. Gay men tended to be much more direct. There was more humor during their conflicts. They were often good friends and they could talk a lot more directly about sex and therefore had more contented sexual relationships because they really understood each other's needs. And for lesbians, much of that was the same. And so when we kind of put all this together, thinking about bids and how partners show up for one another in returning those bids, this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and again, according to Gottman's research, when your partner attempts to communicate with you, either verbally or physically, you have basically three options. The first, turn away from her, ignore or pacify her with a response of indifference, turn against her and actually express outright frustration or anger at her for the interruption or her need for your attention, or turn toward her and acknowledge your partner's attempt to connect with you by either engaging with them in the moment or affirming your interest and offering an alternate time when you will be more available to engage with her. I feel like that last bit is super, super important because 
I will say that just in my, in my own relationships, I have noticed that that little piece seems like maybe the other person doesn't realize that's an option <laughs> to say like, Hey, I'm in the middle of something. This is important to me. I hear what you're saying. Can we do it, you know, at six o'clock or whatever? But I feel like that is a very important piece of information. Yeah. It also makes me think of something else that Dr. Gottman speaks often about and talking about people don't get married thinking their relationship won't work or resolve conflicts they're having. But all too often, when a couple is experiencing trouble and seeks help, everyone looks at resolving conflict and therapists are trained to ask, what's the problem? Not what is good taking place in your relationship. And I think you know, if couples were to evaluate maybe how they would treat their own closest friends in conflict or in connection or attention versus how they treat their own spouse, I imagine in a lot of these relationships that are crumbling apart, they would see a drastic difference. And that's something Dr. Gottman talks about too, is how friendship is often overlooked in marriages. And it does tend to be equally important to men and women though. Marriages that are most successful that they have studied talk about friendship in marriage and how loving and even their love making is an extension of that friendship that they share. 70% of the passion, romance, and sex for men stems from friendship, and the percentage is even higher for women. So the value of friendship, and as it plays an essential role in a good marriage and a good relationship informing that connection, I think that's really telling that it ranks so highly for both men and women alike. Yeah, for sure. I think another thing that when I think about bids for a connection are sometimes also if the person who's coming to the other partner has been hurt or there's something that's been bothering them, I feel like a lot of times that is can be looked at as a complaint it, but it's actually this person saying, I care so much about this relationship. Like I want it to be better and I want to bring this information to you. And then sometimes as those conversations happen, if one partner leaves and is like, you know, I'm going to quit the conversation for now, but then there's no repair and reconnection afterwards. It's just like, let's just pretend like this never happened. And I feel like that can be just as damaging mm -hmm. to a relationship because nothing is actually getting resolved. And it's like one of those things that I feel like my daughter actually said the other day, we were talking about something, talking about emotions and things and relationships. And she was just like, yeah, if you shove it down, it's going to come out which one way or another eventually. And that's absolutely true. Like when you just ignore things, they will come back out. So if you can manage that and talk about it and discuss it in a healthy way, then you won't have those other issues later. Mm -hmm. And then consider the willingness. Am I even willing at this point to respond to a bid for affection, right? Yeah. One of the interesting things that Dr. Gottman talks about or recommends doing to nurture that sort of friendship in a relationship is he calls it a love map. And he talks about how important it is to keep a love map, which he describes it as the imaginary place in your head where you store all of the relevant information about your partner's life, their dreams, aspirations, worries, and fears. He says that couples with love maps remember the major events in each other's personal history, and they keep updating their information as the facts and feelings of their spouse's world changes. They're about knowing your partner and being known. And one of the most important things in marriage is being and staying interested in your partner and keeping your partner interested in you. No gimmicks, you know, flowers, candy, or can like dinner. It doesn't really work. I mean, unless your partner is genuinely interested in you and their face lights up when you enter the room. No, I agree. And I think that, you know, if you look at a relationship, it's, it didn't, not every, you didn't start, you know, like managing a household and grocery shopping and cooking and doing all the things. Like it started from somewhere else, a genuine connection and interest. And I, it, 
I think that it can be very easy for that to get lost. And for, and, and the other thing is that, you know, I think there is this attitude in, in some ways, which I feel like I'm seeing a shift, especially with just the whole mental health shift in general of that. Well, we got married now. So now we're done. Like, this is just, it's like, no, it's people grow and change. And part of the way you keep that relationship going as each of you grow and change is by maintaining that connection and also being friends, being a supporter. And, you know, it's interesting when you mentioned that most men especially would, would treat their male friends a little bit differently, but I think it's because, you know, oftentimes Mm -hmm. that whole idea of, Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring this up to you yeah. or not. This is mm-hmm. bothering me, but I'm not going to bring it up to you. And then all that resentment forms. And so then it's like when the other yes. person comes to you with a complaint, like you're, you have contempt, you're rolling your eyes, yeah. you're, because you're thinking about yeah. this want mm-hmm. maybe a laundry list yeah. of things that you're That's annoyed about, but you it. haven't actually mentioned it. It's so easy for things to get in a prickly place unnecessarily because people want to, avoid instead of you know making little Mm -hmm. little efforts one of the things that I thought was interesting as well is that in one of his workshops Gottman said he regularly hears women complain that they are under attack verbally when all they really want to do is talk be understood and accepted by their partner and then he Mm -hmm. mentioned something that that I guess I just mentioned as well that Couples in happy marriages tend to have less conflict because they do a better job of repairing the damage from a fight or disagreement. So some people are effective in making repairs and others are clumsy or ineffective. And he says that's not important. It's really a matter of whether they have enough emotional savings in the bank Mm -hmm. that makes repair attempts work. And that comes from the quality of the friendship, which makes total sense to Mm -hmm. me. Because the other thing too is that if if you're not regularly repairing Mm -hmm. after a disagreement... Yeah. And you have like a really big one. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of negative feelings after that because you're going to be thinking, well, I guess this is the same. I guess we're going to, you know, not talk for two days or whatever it is. His book also looks at different or alleged major differences between men and women. And he believes it's actually time to bring the discussion back to earth. And he explores the role of anger in marriage. So men aren't from Mars, nor women are from Venus is what he says. And it's important to realize that we're both the same. We're both operating on the same principles. And that at the end of a hard day, both men and women want the same thing to be sure there are differences, but they tend to be style stylistic. For example, men are compulsive problem solvers while women are emotional facilitators, but we both share the same traits. We all need support, affection, and to be listened to. When we start to realize that men and women are quite alike, it will reduce a lot of the strange advice we get about relationships. I feel like that is definitely true because I will say that I know that just like my own relationship issues, like the same thing that tr- that tends to trigger both is like that judgment or shame. It just shows up very differently. And, you know, but it's like, because what I always say is we're the same but different like personality wise, but also it's like, it's the same kind of thing. It just shows up differently. I like the whole wording of they tend to be stylistic because that definitely describes it. Very true. But there are some action steps you can take to start working on a healthier relationship. And I will say that we all are operating off the tools we've been given relationally. And some of us, I would say maybe a lot of us, weren't given great relational tools. Um, They weren't modeled to us. So some of this may be more difficult for you than other things. And some of it may be something you have to work on, you know, like an individual therapy, especially if you struggle with being emotionally vulnerable or even knowing what emotions are or your own emotions are. If you can only name like one emotion, probably you might you know, want to dig a little deeper there because it will help not only your romantic relationships, but all your relationships. But one thing you can do is to share your feelings and be vulnerable 
it's easier said than done. People aren't vulnerable because they're afraid they'll be rejected or, you know, made fun of or made to feel judged or shamed, any of those things. But if you open up to your partner, if you're just looking to share, say that. Don't assume that the other person knows what you need. And in the same vein, take time to look inward to determine what you need and then communicate that directly. We can't fault people for showing up for us incorrectly if we know we need something specific, but then we don't communicate that. But by the same token, if you and your partner are working on showing up in a healthier way, if this is something you know you need to work on, communicate if the response wasn't what you needed be able to say why and what you would have preferred and then give them some grace and compassion to try again. This person is trying to show up and change their behavior and love you. And I feel like sometimes we're, we are harsher to the people closest to us than maybe, you know, our neighbor or our coworker. We wouldn't necessarily even say some things that we say to our partners to some of these other people. So maybe give them a little grace. Most of us weren't raised in households where we saw healthy conflict resolution, and we're still learning. So here's an example. You share how you're feeling about something that really bothered you. Your partner immediately starts responding with how they feel. You now feel unheard, and you wonder, why did you even bother sharing? Let your partner know that while you do want to hear their feelings, when you're sharing your feelings about something, what you're looking for is understanding and to feel heard. And then perhaps after focusing on your feelings, your partner could take some time to think about it and then come back, you know, another time to ask if you'd be open to hearing your thoughts. I feel like a lot of times we complicate things and we just automatically go to worst case, like, well, they didn't listen to me, so I can't ever talk to them. And it's like, it's just little baby steps. We just need to make, it's kind of like baking a cake. Like if you're figuring out from scratch, like you may need to tweak things here and there to get the perfect recipe. But once you figure it out, You don't have to reinvent the wheel after that. You can just keep going by that same blueprint of communication so that things are just easier. With that, another great tip is to listen deeply. So when your partner is sharing, focus on what they're saying and what you're hearing from them. Be curious if you're not sure what they mean. Reflect back what you heard and see if you're understanding how they're feeling. These are moments that help build trust in a relationship and also allow you to better understand your partner. I really like this one a lot because I think it's very connected to the first tip you shared and that dynamic that happens sometimes where you share how you feel, but your partner, rather than responding to that, immediately comes back with how they feel and it can feel That can end up feeling a little demoralizing and like you're not even heard. But taking a moment and becoming more emotionally curious about what your partner is experiencing, and I think taking a time to pause and not be thinking about your own response in the midst of them sharing is really important. And I think that's very a very connected piece to the bids, right? Because it's about being very intentional with trying to understand your partner and what they're going through and trying to understand their experience of something. There's a time for everyone to share, but it's not so much of a back and forth or a interaction that builds intimacy and connection if we are just vying to be heard and just have our side heard. So I think that was a great one. Oh, I was just going to say real quick that the other thing is, I feel like the one thing I like about the idea of being curious is that I feel like when we make assumptions about what our partner means or what it is they're feeling, that's when we get into trouble because sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they're wrong a lot. Mm -hmm. So, and just the whole idea too, Mm -hmm. because especially if there's been a lot of conflict and not very, not very great conflict resolution, being curious and remembering like we're on the same team, mm-hmm. like we're both struggling a little bit with this, but like the, we both have the same end yes. goal, which is that we both feel heard. Mm-hmm. And I feel like making someone feel really heard and seen is like one of the greatest gifts that you can give them and, and the greatest way to, to build like a very 
Yes. Deep connection. Yeah. And a great way to de-escalate a conflict. I think a lot of times people become, partners become so dysregulated in conflict because they are just getting to a point where they are just trying to be heard and they feel like they're either not cared enough about to be heard or it's just not, it's just falling on a deaf ears. Or they're having to take an adversarial stance and just demand and fight their way to be heard or understood. Yeah, I, I love that. Rem remembering that you're not adversaries, that you have the same goal, end goal. And that actually goes right into the next tip, which is managing conflict in a healthy way. So if you get into a discussion with your partner and you feel yourself getting defensive, first off, recognize that. Take a pause. This means your ego is being triggered and you may need a moment to center yourself so that you can actually have a productive conversation. On the other hand, if your partner is becoming defensive, maybe point out that the discussion seems to be going awry and take a little break, a break for each of you. And that maybe coming back in a bit would be more helpful than continuing on in that way. Usually we get defensive when we feel judged or shamed. Sometimes that's not even about what our partner is saying to us, but about something from the past that's actually bubbling up and being triggered in us. If you need a break because you're feeling overwhelmed, just say that. But say it, say it kindly, say it with empathy. Don't just walk off. Be vulnerable and honest about where you are and ask for 20 minutes. Whatever you do, if you ask for a break, it is your responsibility to come back to your partner and re-engage in the conversation. But remember, do it with kindness, but take a moment. If you regularly just walk away and say you need time to yourself, and then when you come back, you act as if everything's fine and there's no real repair or resolution, an environment's being created where your partner may begin to avoid talking to you and sharing things that you really do need to hear because maybe they're afraid you'll just walk off and they'll feel abandoned. Everyone needs a break at some point. It's healthy to take a break, but be honest. Give a time amount that you'll be taking and then re-engage to repair and find resolution. And the last tip, which I sort of mentioned a little bit, is not to make assumptions. Don't assume how your partner feels. If they are acting differently or seem to respond in a way that makes you think they're angry, ask just simply ask. You seem off. Is everything okay? When we make assumptions about what's going on with our partners or altern alternatively, that's right, when we decide what a reaction is going to be before we come to our partners with something, we are actually taking away their individuality and their individual experience. So the more you can approach your partner with curiosity, the more connected you'll be and the greater understanding you'll gain. And it also, I know, for me, when, when I'm approached with curiosity, I, I feel more, I mean, it softens you a little bit because it's like, oh, this person actually cares yeah. what I feel like they're trying to understand me. And I mean, trying to understand somebody is just like right. such a nice feeling, mm -hmm. especially if you're somebody who feels like mm -hmm. you've never been understood. I feel like that's just a really yeah. nice thing to do. But I think that there's, you know. I think that it's very hard to take our own egos out of stuff. And I feel like part of it is, is being, you know, it goes back to, we were talking about emotional intelligence with, mm -hmm. with the episode from a little bit ago <laughs> where it comes back to self-awareness because oftentimes we'll be talking about something and all of a sudden it's like, Ooh, I feel like I'm getting worked up, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but I may not necessarily mm -hmm. connect that. Like, I don't know that it's about this thing. It's about this other thing that felt kind of yes. similar. So I think that that all goes back to, you know, the more we know ourselves, the, the more we can mm -hmm. actually show up in a healthier way in our relationships and know how to honor our own experience, honor our own experience, but also you know, be curious, loving partners yeah. to our yeah. partners. And far better friends with our partners and with our connections beyond just our romantic ones. 
No, for sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I'll share that I had a not great model for what a relationship or marriage should look like growing up. Mm-hmm. Don't recommend. Wasn't, wasn't real helpful. But, you know, when I think about what, you know, kind of things is my ideal partner, you know, I want, I want to live a life where I'm living it with my best friend, where it feels like just everything's an adventure. And because life gets hard, there's so many hard things that happen that we don't have any control over. So it's like, I know that there's stuff that's going to happen. It's going to throw me for a loop. So until those things happen, I want to be having a good time. I want to be, you know, I want to support the person I'm with. I want to feel supported. I want to feel like we can talk about anything. And I feel like, yeah, I don't know if that's the, I don't know if that's what most people envision when they envision a partner, but I, I think that if they did envision that more, the approaches might be a little bit different. I don't know. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. It kind of reminds me too. I, there's an old saying I heard it is, it's, it can be hard to go through life alone, but it's even harder to go through life in a relationship in which you're alone. <laughs> it's like the alone, the aloneness is that much more palpable when you are partnered with somebody who is not present emotionally, just, and you are that, that aloneness is just resounds. And it makes life a lot harder. It makes the hard times that much harder because you're now also, it's like you just drag this awful feeling burden from place to place through trial and tribulation. And even the happy, joyous moments don't feel as good as they, as they could, or they all. Hopefully this gave everyone some insights on how to make their connections a little bit stronger in their relationships and some things they could do. And we really appreciate you listening. Thank you for joining us this week. As always, if you'd like more information and support, please check out our site at dartmouth-health.cobalt.care for additional content, connection to resources, support groups that you can sign up to attend, or to connect to one of our clinicians for counseling, psychotherapy, or medication evaluation. We appreciate you listening and hope you have a wonderful week.